Welcome back to the Electronics Inside, the show where we tear down tools, toys and appliances just to find out what's inside. I asked the production team if I could have the budget for one of those really big fancy Dyson fans that don't have any blades. They said I could have half. Now if you don't already know what I'm talking about, you've got to imagine this with a big either a round for the first generation ones or an oval opening with no fan blades in it. Now this is a very interesting method of circulating air and it's not a new idea and we will get into that a bit later. But anyway, this is the base off of one minus the big bladeless bit at the top and you can sort of see it does the fancy tippy things and you can turn it and it doesn't really do much more I mean it's a fan but electronically they're way more interesting or at least I'm hoping they are way more interesting than the old school AC motors uh, squirrel cage motor on the back of a big bladed fan that blows in your face this one that is clearly missing some bits. It's a very, very dirty. Uh, I did actually turn this on and even in this state, it threw out a couple of dust bunnies just out the top. Um, all, all it's really got is a power button. I mean, it's seen some usage, but let's get into it and see what makes it tick. Okay, the specific model we have here is an AM06, 300 millimeters which makes me think it was one of the original generation round ones. I don't really know why they went for an oval shape later. I guess if you're not using a rotating fan, there's no reason for it to be round. You don't need the, the surface area or the rotational area of the whole fan. So it saves space, saves footprint for potentially the same volume of air. Now I'm sure everybody watching is well aware that this concept of a bladeless fan is not really a bladeless fan. It's just using a fan in the base here, which is why you've got all these perforations and vents in the bottom, to pull air in and eject it out the top here through that cleverly shaped ring. And that does what's called induced airflow, which basically means the fan moves a volume of air. Let's assume it's really efficient and this moves a litre of air a second. It could, I guess, about that. And that forced one litre of air per second sucks through, because of the low pressure it creates, two litres a second. So you're getting a total forced air volume of three litres a second from the mechanical effort of moving one litre of air a second. And I've used litres of air per second uh because i'm thinking volumetrically i mean it would work roughly the same with mass flow rates but you know liters a second seems appropriate or cubic feet per second or whatever it is okay base off a high quality dyson build all the same i'm guessing this is abs no polycarbonate nice oh you know it's always good when there's a oh the state of this grim uh, how far that flex will come out. Nope. There's a big torque in the center. Ah! Oh, this does have a rotating. Oh, broken bit of something fell out with it. I cannot believe how much dust is in this. So on the bottom, we do actually, this section actually rotates. So it does have the, that sort of panning around the room type functionality that no, normal fans, can I call them normal fans? Is everyone all right with that? The, the plastic on the main body of it, it's that sort of plastic with an over-molded rubber and you can see where that started to deteriorate and delaminate and you can just see the shiny polycarbonate, whatever it is underneath, which is a little bit of a shame. I mean, I, I don't know what environment or what usage this had in its useful life, but you wouldn't have thought it'd be so hard it would really delaminate and stuff, would you? Oh, that's a big screw. I suppose it's holding all the moving bits onto a static bit. Again, so at the top you can see that really carefully arranged ducting to try and get the air movement up through the, the plenum. I'm going to call it a plenum uh, in the right way. There's a few more screws, maybe I'll take those out. 
Okay, this part doesn't turn. I know it looks like the intake from a jet engine, but this is a static piece and could actually be a, are they called stators? Is that right? If you imagine like on a steam turbine or a jet engine, the bit that turns, the rotor, um, would lose efficiency really quickly because as the pitched blades make contact with the fluid or air moving one way, if they all move in the same direction, which on a common axle they would, the fluid would start rotating and you couldn't actually add more energy to it. So what you don't see when you see those big impressive photos of the rotors for a gas turbine removed or something is on the casing that it goes around it. There are what are called stators. I think they're called stators and they are blades that are fixed to the casing but point the other direction to make sure that the fluid can't rotate or is, is trained against rotation. So the turbine the, the fluid sort of wiggles between the rotors and the stators as it goes through the engine. Very interesting that this part's actually got perforations in it. I'm not, I'm not going to get in the woods yet. So I'm going to get the whole thing apart before we start making assumptions because that's got a filter on it like it's sucking air in. One of the coolest uses I can think of for induced airflow is inflating the slides for escaping an aircraft. So they are basically filled by rocket motors because there is a, a limited time frame that they're allowed to operate. I think it's two seconds from nothing to fully inflate it. And these things are huge. Um, and the best way to produce that gas is with a chemical reaction. So they use a rocket motor. The trouble is the exhaust from this like rocket motor is obviously hot and would melt the plastic in no time at all. So what they do is they use the rocket motor to make that high velocity gas, but they indu use induced airflow to suck in cold air around it. And that mixture of the combustion gases from the rocket engine and the induced airflow from the ambient surroundings is enough airflow to fill up that slide in less than two seconds. It's awesome. And if you get a chance, pull the cord on one. No, wait, no, FAA, I didn't say that. So first look at a motor. Uh, four fairly small cores. Oh no, there's more than four. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Like a whole rainbow down here. One, two, three, five, six, seven, going to this junction box. And then from the junction box to the motor, we have three larger cores. One, two, three, and one, two, three, four, five, smaller. So I would think for an electronically commutated motor, phases, maybe Hall effect for feedback. Oh yeah, that's just nasty. Hmm. Here's a challenge because this basically being held in by the wires now. Doo -doo -doo. Hey, they are. Oh, <laughs> oh, that's just grim. Look at it. Goodness me. Oh, wow. Oh, I need to wash my hands after this. Aha. Didn't see those screws before. There we go. That probably would have made more sense doing it the other way around. Ooh, nice. All right, let's get back to this base then. See, I could remove that one, but that doesn't help me get the rest of them. It's this motor linkage that I can't work out. Oh, it's got a circlip on it. Maybe it's supposed to be in a particular position. Okay, people, who's ready for a bad idea? Let's plug this in, see if I can get the base turning. I might have to look up the manual to know how to do that. Okay, I'm gonna hold on to the plastic, not the bit that's gonna rotate on here, just in case it turns on. Wow. That moves some. Beautiful soft start motors though. Four, five, oh, it goes faster. Whoa. What I don't know though is how to make it rotate. 
So yeah, I'm gonna Google that quickly. Well, I feel robbed. Apparently there's no way of operating the oscillation mode without the remote, which I can't believe somebody sold this to me as faulty for spares and repairs on eBay without telling me it needed a remote. Beside the fact it was missing half the actual fan itself. Some people, just rude. Right. I don't think I'm gonna... Trouble is that motor's got a gearbox on it, which I guess has got a worm gear in it because I can't back drive it. You just see the edge of a circuit around that shaft. I wonder if I get the right size bit if I'll just be able to poke it off. When we started the electronics inside nearly three years ago now, I was determined that I was gonna have all the tools I was gonna need handy. And one of the tools that I bought at the time were this pair of circlip pliers, thinking, thinking, if I'm taking stuff apart, I'm gonna need these every week. They're gonna be really handy. I have not needed them so far. This is the first time, as you can tell by the fact they're still in the box. So uh, let's pop these open and see if I can lose an eyeball. Is that enough just to get it spread to lift? Yay! Fair clip. First one removed in the electronics inside, off. There we go, first look inside. That's going to be a motor with a built-in gearbox. Again, Dyson always do a nice PCB. Since remember the one on the robot vacuum cleaner was heavily conformally coated and we couldn't really read anything. Based on the dusty environment this is in, I would think it's going to be very similar. So, connections. Main motor. Main motor, or appears to be. motor for rotation and you've got the PCB at the front which I now know is going to have the IR sensor on it as well as a power board and actually drives a little LCD display on the front. The speeds were represented on a little um, two digits seven segment display. And that's just the wiring loom that goes up to the motor. Quite nice to get this open. This, this junction box where all of those little wires, three of them actually turn into large wires. So this is not just a, like a ferrite choke or anything. This has actually got something in it. Oh, just a connector. Well, that would have probably been handy when I was trying to get that fan through this round thing earlier. Never mind. Live and learn. See that rotation motor will come out and we can have a little look at what it is. I suspect this will be an off-the-shelf part, nothing special. 220 to 230 volts, 240 volts sorry, got a picture of a gear on it. Synchronous motor and what else can we read? 50-60 hertz. Ooh, synchronous motor at 50-60 hertz, so your oscillation is going to vary depending on which country you're running this in. I don't think it's a big major issue but interesting all the same. Okay, power cord separated. I'm interested as to why you would bother with this solder and these crimped on bits. It's like the yellow and orange leads were made at a separate factory with the overmolding done. And then separately they soldered onto the leads going to the plug, which of course would be localized. It just seems really over the top. There is no reason you couldn't have crimped the 1.5 mil cores. And this should fit through this molding in the base. So you could have sent this lead with the phase cables to be over molded unless that's made at a different place and you didn't want the two manufacturers getting cross at each other because I genuinely can't think of another reason why you would make that extra solder joint which is an extra point of failure extra operation you've got to do I feel like it would have just been easier to do that in one piece sadly or perhaps for the best depending on which way you look at it that shaft is either slightly rusty or has some very good compound firm sticking it the nut on there to make sure it doesn't come off it definitely doesn't want to but i don't think there's anything too interesting to see other than the end of the motor shaft and that motor it's got a part number on it but that will be a bespoke uh, dyson part number and i think we can say that is an electronically commutated motor just from the number of cores that are going up there i suspect we've got three three phases going up. So this is going to be multiples of three, three, three windings. Then you've got five sense cables going back to for position sensor. 
And on this board, we have giant capacitor, um, which I'm very keen not to touch the back of, but that's fun. Um, we've got six MOSFETs that look like they were used to drive those. I would think six MOSFETs, so you've got the three windings, but you can drive them positive and negative. Sadly, getting part numbers off of these conformally coated ICs is a nightmare. On the back side, a lot of surface mount stuff. Not much in terms of ICs and uh, microcontrollers or anything. It's relatively simple to run, I suppose. Interesting that you've got something up here on this display board, which makes me think that's probably a seven second display driver. That's probably serially interfaced back to the board. And then you've got the IR receiver and the tactile switch or the tactile dome. Going back to probably that microcontroller as the main brain. I was very interested to see inside this Dyson fan and I'll be honest, I think you're paying a lot of money for something that's not all that special. Um, control of a high speed motor, maybe some slightly original design, but that's just largely a pug fan. I think you're paying a lot for not a lot in this particular model. I hope you found this an interesting teardown. I really have. Uh, if you would like me to try and get the budget to tear down one of the new hot and cold ones, find out if there is anything fancy like a thermoelectric generator or Peltier effect cooler or Seebeck effect generator in there, let me know over at the Element 14 community. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you next time when I've washed my hands and cleaned up all this dust. <laughs>